Welcome back to another episode of the Pharmacist Diaries podcast. This episode is a part of a series I'm creating for World Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week, a global campaign that highlights one of the most urgent health challenges of our time, antimicrobial resistance. You might have heard of the term superbugs or read headlines about antibiotic resistant infections, but behind these terms are real people, real stories and real healthcare workers on the front lines of this crisis. My hope is that these conversations will serve as a reminder that antimicrobial resistance isn't just a future threat. It is literally happening right now, affecting real people and requiring all of us to play our part in preserving these life-saving medicines for future generations. Today, we are so fortunate to hear from Vanessa Carter. My introduction to Vanessa is super long, but it deserves exactly what I'm giving you because there is so much information to share about her. In 2004, Vanessa was involved in a severe car accident in Johannesburg, and she spent around 10 years through the medical system reconstructing damage caused to her face, which resulted in MRSA. Back in 2013, she combined her patient experience alongside her marketing skills by offering medical website design to healthcare professionals because one of the greatest challenges that she faced was the lack of access to online specialists and accurate, decipherable information. In 2013, Vanessa had been appointed as an advising patient to multiple organizations and groups, including the South African Antibiotic Stewardship Programme. She has been nominated for various Business Achiever Awards and she won the Woman of the Year Director's Award in recognition of her activism and community upliftment. One of Vanessa's major achievements has been her contribution towards the implementation of the Antibiotic Guardian Pledge Campaign in South Africa. The pledge was later adopted by the National Department of Health and Vanessa won the Antibiotic Guardian Communications Award for her commitment to promoting patient and public engagement. And in 2020, she started a role as a part-time communication manager for the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association. We are so incredibly fortunate to have her here today, and I cannot wait to dive into this conversation. Hello, Vanessa. Hello, Venetia. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and such a long introduction because I just felt like I couldn't decide what to even include because there were so many incredible things that you're involved with, things that you've implemented, so many different skills that you've used as well in this journey that I just was like, no, I'm just going to have all of it. It's a long intro, but one that's kind of worth all of the information. So I'm so happy to have you here and I'm so glad I'm doing this series for World Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week. It's such a a mouthful, but we like to call it WOW. And um, today I really want you to be able to share with us your journey as a patient. So my first question to you is that can you share that story and tell us what was your first experience with antimicrobial resistance as part of that journey? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Anisha. Uh, Thank you for having me and for that kind introduction. Um, I think the bio that you read was, uh, you know, it, it, it's an ever evolving bio um, as advocacy is. Uh, there's one thing I just want to quickly add is that I'm also the chair of the WHO task force of AMR survivors. So it's come a very, very long way. Um, but, you know, uh, I've been advocating for the last 11 years. But before I started as an advocate, um, I, was a, I was a patient, you know, I was somebody that was in and out of hospitals. Um, I was fighting for my life many times. Um, and to kind of give you a little bit of a brief background, uh, in 2004, I had a severe car accident in Johannesburg, South Africa. As you can hear about my accent, I'm South African. Um, and I, uh, you know, I was a passenger in the car. The driver, uh, there was a car that overtook our driver on the wrong side of the road and our car went into a barn spin. Um, and ended up into a concrete wall. And I was resuscitated on the side of the road, taken to Charlotte McSeke Johannesburg Academic Hospital, which is a public hospital in Johannesburg. Um, I was kept kept on life support, and I was put through quite a few surgeries to save my life. Um, one of them was a stomach surgery, abdominal surgery. Uh, we had a lot of internal bleeding. Um, and then, uh, I had a fractured pelvis, I had neck injuries, back injuries, 
Um, and I had multiple facial fractures as well. And I also lost the right eye. Um, so, uh, you know, I recovered from that and I kind of had to then navigate the whole system afterwards. Um, and the most complicated were because of my face, because I needed different types of specialists to reconstruct my face. Uh, and so I had, I needed different types of prosthetics put into my face to make it look normal again. Um, and so to cut a long story short in my, uh, sixth year of facial reconstructions, I had a prosthetic implanted, uh, to kind of, you know, correct the, the bone, uh, you know, the cheekbones that were, where they were broken. Um, and you know, I mean, this was kind of not the first surgery I had, I was discharged. Uh, you know, but, but two weeks after I was discharged, I felt fluid on my face. I was out shopping one day. I got into my car. I felt this fluid. I pulled down the rear view mirror and I saw this pus seeping out of my face. And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? Because I haven't seen this before with the other prosthetics, you know, that, that, that they were implanted. Um, so I phoned my, uh, doctor's offices, which is a plastic surgeon and maxillofacial surgeon at the time. And they said, you know, sounds like you might have an infection, uh, come into the hospital. And what happened was I was admitted to the hospital. They did a debridement, which is kind of like a cleaning of the prosthetic. Uh, they did a little bit of reconstructive surgery because the infection had eaten the skin away. I was discharged, but two weeks later, the infection came back again. We did the same kind of surgery, but two weeks later, the infection came back again. I was then kind of, you know, passing between specialists. So, you know, between the plastic surgeon, maxillofacial surgeon, max, uh, ophthalmologist, ENT surgeon, told that I needed to go for sinus drainage uh, because I damaged all the sinuses on my right hand side. Um, so we did a sinus drainage, but two weeks later, for the third time, the infection was back again. So, and I, you know, I went for it, you know, back again, where I was told that I need to go for another sinus drainage. And at this point in time, I had a very good relationship with my plastic surgeon. And he said to me, Vanessa, if you do not re remove this uh, prosthetic, uh, which is very infected, it, it, this infection is not going to go away. Um, but I was getting differing opinions from the other doctors. You know, they were trying to start, kind of save the prosthetic and the plastic surgeon was trying to kind of remove it. Um, and so uh, I went and I decided to go for the sinus drainage to try and save the prosthetic because I didn't want to have this prosthetic taken out. It would have meant quite a devastating effect on me. But lo and behold, when I woke up, the prosthetic was removed um, and the plastic surgeon had done it, even though he wasn't supposed to be in the theater at the time. And for the first time, when I woke up after the anesthetic, um, the ENT surgeon at the end of the bed said to me, uh, the plastic surgeon removed the prosthetic and he sent it off for testing. And that was the first time I heard the word test. So this was like 11 months from the, you know, when the infection started, ongoing surgeries, 11 months, almost a year, that I heard the word test. And so alarm bells went off in my head. And I decided to phone the pathology officers and I said, please, can you send me a copy of the test? so that I can see what's going on. Because for me, an infection was an infection. I didn't understand why this was so life-threatening and so on. So um, when I got it, at the top of the test said MRSA, which is an acronym for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus Aureus. At the time, I couldn't pronounce it. I didn't know what that was. On the, on the right-hand side was a whole lot of R's, meaning I was either resistant and a whole lot of S's, so five S's, lots of R's, S meaning I was susceptible. Um, on the left-hand side was a whole lot of names of antibiotics. And then when I got on the internet, like any normal patient gets on the internet and starts Googling what that means, up came the word antibiotic resistance. And uh, the more I read about it, the more I started realizing um, that we were actually treating this infection wrong. You know, uh, during that period of time, I was being prescribed the antibiotics that I was resistant to already. And there was no communication. There was no, you know, working together and so on. Um, there was no change of antibiotic. And I was just as much to blame because I was, you know, when the infection wasn't clearing, I was kind of just, you know, stopping the antibiotic saying it's not working. So what's the point? 
Um, so yeah, I mean, how I fixed my face, because I get this question very often is, um, I was told that they couldn't do surgery for another year. I educated myself as much as I could about antibiotic resistance and what that actually meant to me as a patient. Um, I sent my medical record off to probably about 25 different surgeons overseas that were specialists in facial reconstructions. I was very lucky that I got one very positive reply from Boston, uh, a Brigham and Women's Hospital in, uh, in Boston uh, from a face transplant surgeon, believe it or not. So I knew he knew what he was talking about. Um, and he said to me, you know, no more foreign objects, uh, do a cut the bone, which they call a zygomatic osteotomy, very complicated words. So literally cut the bone, don't put in more foreign objects and go find a doctor in Johannesburg that can give you that exact advice, which I did. Um, and, uh, so I visited different doctors. I found one that professor in Johannesburg called professor Johan P. Reinick, um, who did the surgery, brilliant surgeon. But like a bad case of deja vu, the infection came back again. But this time worse in the skin and the bone. Uh, so uh, he rotated what they call last resort antibiotics. So uh, vancomycin, clindamycin, you know, if you're a pharmacist, you know these names. Um, Linozolid, uh, you know, I didn't actually capture all of the names of them because, you know, at that point in time, I still wasn't educated enough about doing that. Um, but those were the three, uh, that, that I captured. Um, and so when I say rotating, oh, I was an outpatient. I went home, I would come back every week and he would check on the progress of the, of the infection. And if it wasn't clearing, he would then change me to another antibiotic. And within three months, um, you know, um, the infection finally cleared and, uh, you know, um, I can't show you photos of what I looked like at the time when they removed the prosthetic initially, but let me tell you, I had a huge gaping hole in my face. I couldn't wear a prosthetic. Um, I did things like going, I had to cover my face basically. You know, if I had kids at the time, I had my, my three year old son, I'd go to his nursery school and they'd say, what's wrong with your mommy's face? She looks like a zombie. You know, these are things that you kind of go through, uh, you know, when, when you have a facial disfigurement. Um, and of course there's that fear, you know, if this infection doesn't go away, is it going to go into the bloodstream? Is it going to become sepsis? What, what do we do? Um, so yeah, so here I am. I, I mean, a lot has happened since then, but that 10 year journey was really discovering the, um, the implications of resistant infections and me as a high risk patient in terms of, uh, taking these, these different antibiotics, uh, and what that actually meant to me. What an incredible story and what a long journey as well. Like a decade is a really long period of time to go through the medical system, multiple surgeries, constant infections. And like you said, as a patient, you weren't aware of what resistance meant, how that's going to impact you. And you're even using words like sepsis and bloodstream infection. And at the time, you probably didn't know that if the infection wasn't necessarily treated, that it could lead to that, and that's super dangerous. I did read an article about you that you you had mentioned that you wish that you knew more about antimicrobial resistance earlier in the treatment journey because you were discovering elements of it around one year into it. So what kind of key pieces of information do you wish that every patient should know or be given by a prescriber when they're, when they're given these types of antibiotics? Um, you know, I think definitely for me, number one is always a key sentence and it doesn't take a long time to say it is, you know, if you see that this infection doesn't clear, please come back because we want to monitor for signs of resistance. You know, that might even be too long, uh, you know, so I never heard that from anybody, you know, we, 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 sometimes we just prescribe the course of antibiotics and that's it, you know. But for me, it's that one sentence. If the infection doesn't clear, we just have to monitor that the infection is responding to these antibiotics it, because it might be resistant. It might become resistant. Do you know what I'm saying? So I, again, I, I, I advocate quite heavily about that. Also infection prevention and control. So, 
acronym, the acronym that the medical world uses is RPC. Um, only much later in my journey, I, I used to hear the words right in the beginning was keep it clean. What does keep it clean mean? <laughs> you know, because right in the beginning, you know, you hear these old wives tales of like, keep it clean, use clean water. So do I boil the water? Can I bath? Can I do, you know, so, so when I suffered with that MRSA infection, I realized, hang on, I need to be using sterile water and I need to be using sterile cotton balls and I need to be sterilizing my counter at home. And so I know it sounds ridiculous, but I should have known that as a patient, but we actually don't, you know, so, so, so this kind of, uh, you know, maybe in the healthcare system, they should be doing more about that, you know, giving you more information at the point of time when you have an infection to say, practice strict infection preventer control at home and how you do that, you know, what does it actually mean to a patient? Um, it's obviously in hospital settings, it's very clear. Uh, but also, you know, I also say most of the, the, the marketing for that coming from a marketing background. I'll speak from that perspective. They put the posters above the sink, right? They put the posters above the, you know, um, as somebody who was in ICU many times, I couldn't walk to the sink. So, so where that RPC communication happens, we need to think very carefully in terms of the patient journey. Does it happen when they are admitted to hospital? depending on which ward. So is it, you know, is it RCU, is it the trauma ward, is it the, I mean, I was in the R ward at one point in time. At which point in the journey does that happen? Um, do you, when you go to your doctor uh, for a follow-up, does it happen then? And again, let's change our terminology. Does keep it clean make any difference to patients? It didn't make a difference to me. Um, I think the other thing is really emphasizing uh, the term equal intervals of taking your antibiotics. Um, when I was under the care of Professor Reinecke, that's one thing that he really emphasized with me because back in South Africa, our pharmaceutical packaging said take it twice a day. And, you know, in many countries, this is the problem. Twice a day could mean twice in the morning. It could mean, you know, twice in the afternoon, uh, you know. So I've seen in England that you do, you do kind of have that equal intervals uh, education. Um, but I think we need to be very, very clear on that because that was something that I was doing sometimes is if I was missing a dose, I double dose sometimes. And a lot of patients do that. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think that education at the end of the day comes from everybody. It doesn't just come from our GP. It doesn't just come from, uh, you know, our pharmacist. It's at every single point of the patient journey. So it's the nurse, it's the pharmacist, it's the, on the pharmaceutical packaging. Uh, we need to educate patients as a team. Mm. And I love that because I think as life is evolving and we're becoming very tech savvy, a lot of things are becoming digital. You see videos, short form content, reels on Instagram, lots of people utilizing social media that we've got this golden opportunity to be able to reach a massive audience through video and audio content or video or even not video and audio content, but also the posts that we create through social media. And I think that this platform is a great place to showcase the pharmacy profession. That's what my main aim is. But when I do a series like this, a lot of it is advocating for things that are happening that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm working directly in adult infectious diseases at the moment. And I just thought it was a golden opportunity to try and widen my reach and find more people who would find this information really, really valuable. I think if you had a vision for the future, because you shared some really important things that even I wouldn't expect that my patients to know or not know, and even something as simple as putting a poster above a sink, if people don't get to the sink to realize they need to wash their hands in the first place, then we haven't really communicated our message very well. And we're not reaching the actual target audience that needs it in the first place. But what is your, your vision for patients? What would you love to see in the future in terms of how they could better monitor their antibiotic history, why this even matters for the future and like where the value is? What would you love to see um, in, for other people? Yeah, so that, you know, that's a really tough question because... I'm going to just answer for myself here. You know, I, at the time that I was absolutely oblivious to this thing called antibiotic resistance, I'd only just learned 
that I had antibiotic resistance. Um, I didn't think about this. I didn't think about, you know, monitoring which antibiotics I was on because I was still learning. Um, you know, now fast forward, this is like 11 years later and obviously I do that. But, but we, we, we got to think about patients that don't know anything about antibiotic resistance. The, the problem is, um, is that, uh, you know, where I come from, South Africa, and maybe also in, in the UK, a lot of the times we are expected to be the gatekeeper. I use that word, the gatekeeper. I was the gatekeeper. So, you know, when you, when you go from doctor to doctor, from my experience, they would say, can you tell me when was the last time you went on antibiotics? And I think, in, I think in England, this is probably, you know, if we start looking at dentistry versus GP surgeries versus, you know, the, the hospitals and so on, I think it's pretty much the same because, you know, can, can the dentist see the last time that I was on anti, an antibiotic? Are we the, you know, are we the gatekeepers of that? Um, and if that's the case, education is so, so, so important. Um, but, but also we shouldn't expect patients to be that gatekeeper. There should be some sort of system where, where it actually informs each doctor. Um, I know it sounds like a, a bit of a, you know, a dream to do that, but that's what we need to be working towards to, to, you know, just sort of take less pressure off of patients. Um, because maybe by not knowing, you know, by not knowing, I mean, I know during my journey, I was on penicillin top antibiotics the whole way, even when I had MRSA. Um, how do we know what all of these different classes of antibiotics do? So I could be talking about Kindermast and I could be talking about Vancomast and I could be talking about, uh, you know, amoxicillin, you know, and so on. But, but yeah, I think it is important that we, that we try if we can to keep uh, some sort of record, but again, think about patients that are very ill, especially the elderly and so on. It's not fair for them to be able to, you know, to, to, to do that. Um, so let's come up with, with better solutions. Um, and moving countries as well, you know, this is also a problem. Uh, you know, if, if moving from South Africa to, to England, what I found was when I had all those resistant antibiotic resistant episodes, um, I've had to volunteer that information. Imagine I didn't understand antibiotic resistance. I could never have told my GP. I could never have. You know, every single time I go to a dentist or GP or someone, I always volunteer that information. I'll say, you know, I've really got bad history with MRE. So, so whatever you do, just be very, very vigilant on how you, you know, you, you provide my care. Because of course, you know, I do have ongoing uh, uh, care that's uh, required. Um, and, uh, you know, I use dentists and GPs as an example because that's an ophthalmologist. Those are the, the you know, the, the medical professionals that, that are constantly, um, consult with. Um, and yeah, so again, like I say, that's, um, if only the, the systems work better is what I want to try and say. And, uh, and that, that information also needs to be given access to patients because if they move countries, at least they can take that information with them. We are a long way off from that, but, um, you know, hopefully we can get to that point. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more on quite a lot of those points that you made. You gave me an idea, though. Um, we have amazing records for our vaccinations, especially since the pandemic. Everything is logged on the NHS app for patients where they can scan barcodes and QR codes to show that they've actually been vaccinated. I guess there shouldn't be any problem doing something similar for antibiotic use and recording your history. And that's something that you can have on an app or you could print with you if you're traveling to another, you know, another country or if you're moving countries as well. And even if you're moving from city to city, we are hopeful that the NHS system, especially, especially summary care records, are accessible um, nationwide. So hopefully that will give people an idea. However, we, we are lacking some information from hospitals because that information doesn't necessarily come across. So if you have been as poorly as you were, and going through a paper-based system, potentially, where drug charts are still paper-based, there's no way of all the antibiotics and resistance patterns that you've been exposed to will then transfer back to the GP. So we do have a long way to go, but I think we have to keep trying. We have to keep advocating. We have to still 
communicate on a national and global scale. And I think we are doing that in so many different ways, but of course we can, we can definitely improve um, for sure. I wanted to ask you because you're doing so much um, work on a, a global scale with regards to advocacy, you know, you're involved with high level policy discussions at places like World Health Organization. What do you genuinely see as the most kind of urgent changes that we need to build into our healthcare systems to help people who have drug resistant infections or even those who haven't got it, but preventing them from happening in the first place? Well, yeah, I mean, that is such an important question because policy makes a huge difference to all of this. Uh, you know, so um, I think number one for me would be participatory approaches to designing solutions. And what I mean by that is working with patients to understand, uh, you know, working with all stakeholders, of course, but everybody being at the table to understand what the gaps are to, to designing solutions. Um, I will always say awareness raising because, as you know, Antibiotic resistance is not something that's commonly understood by patients and the public. Um, and I think it also puts a lot of healthcare professionals off in terms of explaining it because you might get into a very large winded conversation. But, you know, we need to find ways to do that. And of course, on the global action plan, for example, uh, you know, and at the political declaration, this is a huge priority um, to, to raise awareness for, for AMR. Uh, it needs to be as common knowledge as, you know, that, that putting sunscreen on, you know, or smoking causes cancer. You know, we need to know overusing antibiotics uh, causes resistance. It's, it's you know, that, that's what we need to aim for. Um, I think also diagnostics. I'm going to say diagnostics because in my case, diagnostics were a huge turning point for me. And I think that, you know, I never, ever blame healthcare professionals because it can't be easy to prescribe antibiotics with something that is, you know, empirical. You know, you, you're basing it on the symptoms. Um, if we had diagnostics uh, the same way that we do, for example, one day, you know, like we do for COVID, where you know it's, it's COVID or you know it's a viral infection, or you know it's a bacterial infection, I think that could make a major difference in how we use uh, antibiotics and other antimicrobial medicines. Um, and I think also we can start teaching this from a young age. People don't always understand the difference between bacteria, viruses, parasites, and, uh, you know, uh, these different four microbes, uh, or, or, you know, these different microbes that we have around us. So if we're only talking about antibiotics, if they understand those key elements about the microbial world, uh, you know, then when we have that discussion saying, you know, this antibiotic's only going to treat a bacterial infection, it might make it a little bit easier. So from a very young age is really important. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 yeah. I was going to say that I love that you, I love that you bring children into this yeah. because they are little sponges. They absorb lots and lots of information. And I have a seven year old. And wow. she's entering into one of the um, Buckinghamshire NHS Trust competitions around World Antimicrobial Resistance Awareness Week. And she's creating a po poster about microbes. And we've been having discussions about what content she can put on the poster, what's important when it comes to antibiotic use, how you can prevent um, infections. We've talked about vaccinations. And we bought a really cool um, children's book about um, germs. And it's one of those really lovely books, which all the little flaps come up and you can see all the little images and pictures and things. And it even talks about all the roles that you can have as a healthcare professional with regards to antibiotics and whether you follow the microbiology route or the pharmacy route or become a GP or become an advocate, all the roles within the, within the book. So it's been really interesting to see how much that she's learning, even from a really small conversation and I just love that you bring young people into it because I think that they are the generation that we really need to focus on to make sure that they are fully educated and understand the impact on the world because they're the ones that can make a difference. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know what, my son, my son has autism, you know, and uh, even him, you know, I've kind of uh, drilled it into him. <laughs> And he, and you know, he gets it, he gets it, you know, I mean, I, I always want to say, you know, uh, the problem with the AMR realm at the moment is everybody's saying it's so scientific. It's, I'm not scientific. Yeah. I'm not a science, uh, uh, you know, expert, 
But it's not about making scientists out of people. It's about creating common knowledge. It's about creating a basic understanding. Um, we don't, I don't think we need to go beyond that. Uh, you know, we, that, that's not what we're here for. So, um, you know, so that, that should be our goal. And as you say, you know, your, 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 your young child, uh, you know, seven years old, that gets the basics of it and also goes home to their parents and puts a little bit of pressure on to say, you know, you shouldn't be uh, doing this. And of course, for a one health approach, you know, you should be washing your hands after you work with that meat. You should be, you know, there, there, there's, there is so much that we can do. So, um, you know, this is a role of an advocate to say, you know, we are here. We are, we are the ones that are feeling the effect of this. There are a lot of people dying and, um, you know, it's, it's so important that, uh, knowledge doesn't necessarily, uh, change behavior, but it certainly gives you the option to make better choices as somebody, you know, that in my case, had I not been given the choice to make better decisions, I might not be here today. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you raised that. I really want to thank you for your time today. And I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to connect. I have connected with you on LinkedIn and obviously saw your story and someone made a recommendation for me to reach out to you as a great patient to obviously share their story and also all of the incredible things that you've been doing over the last 10 years. I'm absolutely amazed by your, by your journey. I'm super inspired by how involved that you've become in the world of antibiotics as a non sort of healthcare professional. And also the link between having a digital marketing background and how that you can use that as a tool um, to, to share more awareness and advocacy. So thank you so much for making the time to have a conversation with me, to share your story with us, and also being an amazing, an amazing advocate for, for what we're trying to achieve. Sure, Anisha, thank you so much for having me and the opportunity to uh, talk about it. Thank you.